Hi, guys. Thank you for listening. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. All right, let's get you to the real show. Hi, I'm Jess. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater. And today we've got a super special guest. Super special guest. Crazy special. Ah, yes. You'll know him as your favorite theme park reviewer slash like comedy music guy, Tony Goldmark. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to have you on. It's, it really is great. So, Tony, tell us a little bit about your wonderful corner of the internet and what exactly you do. Well, uh, my main show, my flagship show, if you will, is called Some Jerk with a Camera, and it's a comedic review show about the various attractions and paraphernalia at theme parks, particularly Disney and Universal Parks. Uh, I have three seasons of that so far up on YouTube, on my channel, youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark. And uh, I also do a show called One Movie Later, where I compare and contrast my preconceptions and postconceptions of current movies, and State of the Parks, which is kind of a um, a news and, and editorial show about goings on at the theme parks. So and uh, and it's a lot of fun and uh, and I try to make it as funny and as weird and offbeat as I possibly can and uh, and people seem to like it at, at least <laughs> the ones who've subscribed to it. You know, I'm actually really into theme parks. I used to go to Disney World every single year, and That's I still awesome. like going whenever I can to like. Uh, we got like local Six Flags and things like that, which aren't as good, but it's all I've got. <laughs> Where are you guys located, by the way? We're doing this all on the interweb, so I'm not actually... This is... <laughs> I've never met either of these gentlemen. Peeling back the curtain for you listeners, we're not actually in the same room together. We're all, we're doing this on the interwebs, so I have no idea where these people are located. Nor what we look like. <laughs> no, not at all. Not even remotely. <laughs> you might know what I look like. I, I have my face in some of the thumbnails. <laughs> <sighs> But no, I'm located in Michigan, uh, the boringest state in the Midwest, um, specifically mm. right in the city that houses the Detroit airport, or also known as Detroit. Mm. Um, it's a shithole full of people who steal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize, by the way, for that. <laughs> I'm, in, uh, I'm in upstate New York, uh, where ah. there's nothing. <laughs> All right, see... So you guys are are both much closer to Disney World, like like so. Since Disney World is much bigger, I guess you guys always thought, well, you know, we could we could. It, it, I mean, I mean, like Michigan's kind of equidistant from California and Florida, but I guess it, there's just more theme park stuff in in Florida, so you you don't really bother with Disneyland all that much. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna make a full week trip out of it, you're gonna go. I to Orlando. You know, right. The thing is, well, I never went to Disney World. I always went to Disneyland. Hmm. OK. Yeah, I was never a Disney World yeah. guy. Yeah. Uh, well, well, it's it's they're like apples and oranges, really. They, I, I mean, they've got some of the same attractions, but they're such different like environment they're such they're so different tonally i guess you know because disney world it's just they've got so much space to work with they've got too much space to work with as a matter of fact that it it, it feels a little it feels a little more daunting i guess uh disneyland it's kind of all within this one you know tight little space so things are much closer together and it, it's got much more of a local attractions vibe to it although that's kind of eroded over the over the decades but um but yeah they, i i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other although since i live in southern california uh one is certainly closer to me so <laughs> So, Andrew, what was your experiences in um, theme parks, or at least Disney theme parks? Disney? Um, I always liked Disney a lot. Uh, <laughs> I've just, I've been there so many times. I mean, I guess I'm more familiar with, uh, like, late 2000s Disney World, so some of the changes I don't really know too much about, because I haven't been recently. <laughs> but... I've always I've always liked it, and I, I basically have been on every attraction there. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
All right, so why are we talking about Disney World on a musical theater podcast? <laughs> Jess, there's so many musicals in theme parks. There are live musical theater performances in almost every single Disney theme park. Theme parks need a lot of things going on at the same time. Because you got, especially with Disney parks, where you got everybody in the world and their mothers going to them, you know, they, it, you need something to distract them. They can't all be online for the same rides at the same time. You know, that's just a logistical nightmare. You need to constantly put shiny things all over the place. And one of those shiny things is live theater shows that you can do for a much cheaper cost than building an entire ride. You know, it's much, it's much cheaper cheaper to hire actors than to build animatronics. And uh, and so li live theme park shows exist to give people something to do and some place to be so they're not all constantly waiting in line for the big e-tickets uh, at the same time. And for that reason, theme park shows are under no obligation to be good. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes they are good but just accidentally i guess but there's never an obligation they don't have to be entertaining they just have to be diverting which is two different things uh they they yeah they, they have to be one more shiny things for the guests to look like uh, or for the guests to look at and uh disney in particular really likes to do what i call movie shows which is literally just taking one of their biggest movies or at least one of their most current movies condensing it down to about a half hour or so and presenting it on stage often with the songs intact and very little else and that's the show with these you know low paid actors badly reenacting this movie that everyone in the audience has already seen and, and and it's just a matter of, oh, here's a marquee name I recognize. I guess I'll, you know, devote some of my day to that because, oh, there, Beauty and the Beast live? Sure, I'll see that because the line for Tower of Terror is too long or something like that at, at, in the case of Disney's Hollywood Studios. Which, by the way, um, uh, b before we started recording, you mentioned uh, the Beauty and the Beast live show at Disney MGM Studios, which is now Disney Hollywood Studios. Uh, that show... Uh, opened there in 1991 when the movie first came out. It is still running there to this day. Over the it, it, literally, it's been like 27, 28 years now, and the same show, not with the same actors, obviously, but but that venue has been filled with that show. Now compare now that same show, a different version of it, ran at Disneyland, but that only ran from about 91 to 95, I think, and. Uh, and, and and meanwhile, that theater has shown other things since then. But it, it, in Florida, like I said, they have more space, so they have more places for these new shows to be performed. So they just never had a reason to close Beauty and the Beast, and it's still going. It's a, it's a good movie. <laughs> I'm sure it has a draw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it it's definitely it's definitely got a draw. The the show, it's a good movie. The show, I would say, is is. It, it's like if you've seen the movie, there's really no reason to see most of these shows. They don't add a lot of creativity to it. And we, we'll get into that when we talk about some of these specific <laughs> things in Disneyland. But, uh, but you know, I, I, I mean, that's the thing. Like, I couldn't I've never worked at Imagineering, so I couldn't tell you exactly what the corporate culture there is like. But with a lot of these movie shows, it feels very distinctly like they had a strict no creativity rule. Like, at, at, like, uh, like another example, uh, at Disney World and Animal Kingdom, uh, ever since, I think, 2006, I want to say, they've had a Finding Nemo musical. I'm not oh, kidding. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, Finding Nemo the musical. Which was actually the very first project that the Lopez's, Bobby and Kristen Anderson Lopez, later of Frozen fame, uh, worked on for Disney. But if you actually watch that show, like almost every lyric of every song is just dialogue from the movie put to music. <laughs> it, there is there is no personal identity whatsoever on these songs. Like like, like Crush has a song, the the giant turtle, and and he just and his song is just well you never really know, but. But when they know, you'll know, you know, it's just like you, you may as well. You may as well get the Gregory brothers to just do auto tuned versions of Finding Nemo dialogue at some. It's like that. So, so yeah, the, you put the Finding feels, Nemo name on it. You don't have to try yeah, anymore. Like, exactly. everyone's going to go see it. <laughs> Can I give a fun fact about how Kristen Anderson Lopez got that job? Sure, sure. 
Um, she wrote a 15 minute version of Oedipus and sent uh, an operatic version of Oedipus, sent it to them. They're like, she's good at making musicals. Let's give her this Finding Nemo <laughs> Disney thing. See how she is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's throw her like a pile of garbage. <laughs> See, I thought it was just because the Finding Nemo show uses puppets and they were like, well, Bobby Lopez did a- did Avenue Q, so he's used <laughs> to puppets. Like it's any it, like it's functionally any different to write a song for a puppet than for a human, but it's like that's how executives minds work sometimes, especially Michael Eisner. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um so Tony, oh boy. we're already talking yes, about yes, it. it doesn't take yes. long. You picked the four <laughs> shows that we're talking about today. Um, why don't you tell us what those four shows are and why you subjected them specifically to all three of us? Well, the reason I, uh, the reason I chose these four shows in particular is there's actually a lot of live entertainment at at the parks uh, just in general you know you turn a corner and you know you go to New Orleans Square and randomly oh there's a New Orleans jazz band playing or or you go to Frontierland and oh there's you know some guys playing fiddle although although I haven't really seen that for a while but maybe they maybe they retired that band but anyway uh, but these four shows seemed like the best examples of actual musical theater, where there are actually people on stage singing these songs, and and it, and it feels like a theatrical show and not just like a band, where, where where it combines acting, where it combines acting and singing and theatricality to a certain degree. And the four shows are um, two of them are at a venue called the Royal Theater. They do versions of Tangled and Beauty and the Beast there. Um, uh, then uh, and the other two shows are Mickey and the Magical Map and Frozen Live at the Hyperion. I don't know. I feel like I feel like the money shot is is the two Royal Theaters because they're just they are just something. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. We we can talk about the Royal Theater shows. Um, uh, first of all, should I go into some history about the Royal Theater itself? Yes. Go into the history of the Royal Theater. If you've got some. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, the Royal Theater is a small performance venue under a large tent located in Fantasy Fair, which is a sort of offshoot of Fantasyland. By, by the way, all of this stuff is strictly in California in the, at the Disneyland Resort. None of this in the form... None of it is at is in Florida in the same form. It, like, if there's, if there's some sort of equivalent in Florida, it, it's very different. Anyway... Um, the Royal Theater uh, is sort of an, uh, or the Fantasy Fair is sort of an offshoot of Fantasyland located just to the left of Sleeping Beauty Castle. The area itself originally opened in 1956 as Carnation Plaza Gardens, hosted by the Carnation Ice Cream Company, which was a quick service eatery slash performance venue which hosted live music, uh, particularly big band music for a while. Uh, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that stage hosted some of the biggest big band names of all time like Count Basie and Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Benny Goodman. What a step down. Yeah, they, they all... Well, 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 keep in mind, this was, like, this was like the 60s, 70s, and 80s, so these were all nostalgic acts by this point, so they, they were kind of slumming it by performing at Disneyland, but... I mean... Well, still, though, I mean, you're going to go from those <laughs> yeah, bands exactly. to, to, to Smith this. and Jones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the, uh, the, the, eatery, the eatery closed in 1999, uh, but the stage remained, and occasionally it was used for live music, but only occasionally. Most of the time, it was just an empty space where you could sit down and kind of get away from the crowds. That all changed in 2013 when they converted the area into Fantasy Fair, which had two attractions, uh, the Royal Hall, which was a meet and greet area for the princesses and the Royal theater where they perform very low budget sort of fractured fairy tale versions of tangled and beauty and the beast. And they did frozen for a while, but then I guess the, the Hyperion show opened in DCA and that kind of made it redundant. Yeah. They were like, there's actually a good version of it now. We should probably stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Or at least a decent version. Exactly. Of it. Well, and, and we'll get and we'll get into that later in the show. But uh, yeah, the tone of the Royal Theater show, like the premise, is basically retellings of Disney fairy tales. In this case, Tangled and Beauty and the Beast, kind of in the style that Shakespeare plays used to be performed at the Globe Theater centuries ago. Uh, but but filtered also through vaudeville, ba- basically like a fractured fairy tales Shakespeare meets vaudeville kind of vibe uh, meets you know Disney fairy tales, and uh, 
And, and and the plot of the show is basically these two actors named Mr. Smythe and Mr. Jones are are retelling these extremely low budget versions of Tangled and Beauty and the Beast with the princesses actually there with with Belle actually it's super meta yeah with, with <laughs> Belle actually that with what they say is the real Belle like not an actress like this is this is her doing a fucking biopic of her own life. And, yeah. and and for the ta- <laughs> and for the tangled show, uh, Rapunzel and Flynn are are there to <laughs> to reenact it. And the weird thing is, like they do some of the songs, but Belle and Rapunzel aren't actually singing. Like they have Smith, li- like literally Smythe and Jones sing like like the little song that Rapunzel sings in the movie to make her hair glow, like you know, bring back what once was my that song. Yeah, they they sing. Yeah, that. Rapunzel doesn't <laughs> sing that in the show. It's it, Smythe it, and Jones. So yeah. I don't know. I I guess they just couldn't afford to hire an actress who could play Rapunzel and also sing for the show, even though. Even though they got actresses like that for the other two shows we're going to talk about. So uh, I guess this version just was very cheap. So maybe she had to conserve her voice for the meet and greets or something like that. I guess so. Yeah, I I don't really know where to start with this (laughs) other than like the whole thing was terrible. (laughs) You know, um, I, if I, I don't think it, I don't very- think it's terrible. I think it's I, it, I I think it's got a certain low budget charm about it. Shall we say? Like 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 I en- I enjoy because here's the thing. Here's the thing. So many of these shows that you see at Disneyland and Disney World, like I say, are creativity impaired. Like they they literally just perform the movies straight ahead. This one, they actually play around with it. Now, whether or not all the jokes work is very subject to opinion, and and I'm not, you know, there, there's frankly a little too much mugging for my taste in particular, and a little few too many in jokes that are specifically for Disney and theme park fans. Like like for example, in the Tangled show, uh, at one point, you, you know, it, you know, in the tradition of cheap, you know, theater, they use a blue blanket to represent water for the scene where. Rep- Rapunzel and Flynn almost drown, and they they do the Jungle yeah, Cruise. They, they joke. do the they ju- do. They, they turn the <laughs> they turn the blanket around and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, the backside of water." Which you know got a chuckle out of me the first time I saw it, but it's still just kind of a reference for the sake is it, of a is reference. Is it just me? Is it is it just me, or is the song that they come out to it, the imagination song from that Epcot ride? Um. <laughs> No, it's not the same. I guess it's similar. You're talking about happily it's ever after close. at the end, like you know, with, with some imagination and precise pronunciation. That that song, you mean the the intro song? Yeah, yeah. It's they took. There's at least the chord progression, and yeah. and then they use the word imagination in the same spot. Uh, well, I don't know. I think it's it's pretty close. It, it's <laughs> I guess it's similar. I, I I don't. It's not exactly the same song though. Um but uh, <laughs> they don't hold out the imagination. But right, I think if they right, did right. that, it would be basically exactly the same. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very much aimed at kids. But I must say, I do appreciate that they have fun with the premise. I do appreciate that they're not strictly bound to just tell these movies, you know, straightforward. Um, I, one one gag that never fails to get a chuckle out of me is when in the Beauty and the Beast show when they're reenacting the Gaston versus Beast fight and they do it in the style of like 1900s fisticuffs where they're just jumping back and forth and and it, it, I, I don't know the choreography there just makes me laugh. And then Bell comes. It's a little cheesy, like yeah, too and, cheesy. But and then and then Bell comes out and says, "That's not how I remember it." So. I, I I don't know that. I enjoy that. Bell wasn't even was Bell even there when that happened. Um, she she came out in the middle of it, and I, well, I, I think she saw it from the ground in the movie. It's, it's it, it, who knows? <laughs> it's, who cares? It's a low budget theme park show. It's just, it's not supposed. It it doesn't have to be good. Why was Bell so concerned that Gaston get portrayed accurately? Well, because <laughs> like, because of all people, wouldn't she? Well, well, she's a stickler. She's a she's she's very. Uh, she, She's the cinema sins of princesses, I guess. She's- Gaston was definitely stronger than that. Right. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> and taller, too. Mm-hmm. He was very attractive. Dang. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I picked the Beast in, in retrospect. <laughs> he was just kind of dumb, but I can deal. 
Gaston isn't giving me a lap dance right now. Ding. You know what made me really upset about the Beauty and the Beast version of this? Um, of the... Yeah. Um, it's the fact that they didn't have enough Josh Gad, and that they didn't try to kill Maurice in the middle of the woods, and that the Enchantress wasn't just some maiden. Like, those are things that were really important to the story. You know there was a, a, a another Beauty and the Beast movie before the 2017 one? Are you aware of this? We we have much to discuss. What? What? <laughs> oh, it was it any good? Are, are 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 you familiar with animation? Is that a? It, are it, never mind. Okay. Um. Um. There's a film by Jean Cocteau that I saw, but that was the only other one worth looking oh, into. We don't need to talk about that anyway. So. <laughs> uh, love you, Kyle, if you're listening. Um. Yeah, it's it's very low budget by design. Uh, that I I I think they realized well we don't have much to work with, so we may as well make a bunch of jokes at the expense of how charmingly low budget it is. You know how we're how we're clearly just playing all the parts ourselves and doing all these uh, having all these cheap props and and you know. It, and that would be a lot more charming if it wasn't Disney, which we all know has all the money in the world and are clearly just being, you know, pencil pushing, you know, greedy, cheap bastards about this. So anyway, <laughs> I, I'm pretty certain they could have put a much better show on than what this is. Absolutely. Well, uh, part of the issue, <laughs> part of the issue is that they just don't have it. They, they didn't have much space to work with. You know, they had to. Basically, they repainted the tent because, like I said, this was a venue that existed before just for live music, just for a band to come up there and play. And now they got to put a whole, you know, show uh, around it. So, you know, you know, they, they they do the best with what they got. And and I'm, I must say, I do genuinely appreciate that all the music in the show is performed by one piano player because I always like when these shows actually use live music. Like, like there's a lot of there's a lot of live music throughout the parks, but the, these these live shows very rarely actually use live music. They usually just use pre-recorded music. So whenever, you know, whenever Disneyland gives work to musicians, I appreciate that because musicians need regular work. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And especially for how the, young an audience tangled. it's catered to, I think it's effective enough but still i think it could have been here's the most midwest thing i'm gonna say in this entire thing it reminds me of a performance Mm -hmm. at a renaissance fair right yeah it does have kind of a renaissance fair vibe about it but they don't commit quite to that yeah if they had like committed to it and been like the mud wrestling twins or something like that given each one a little Mm -hmm. bit more personality than general goofy guy i think it would have had a little bit more charm Right. <laughs> but it is different actors every time and you and you can't really blame that on them. Uh is there Smythe and and Jones merchandise or anything like that that I can get my hands on? Or Not fanfic? that I'm aware of. I re- <laughs> I, that's what I'm I want. Sure, there's fan fiction. Yeah, after <laughs> after they put out the Jungle Cruise movie, like that's next. Like they've tried Pirates and that sort of fizzled out, and they tried a Haunted Mansion movie. Next, I want to see the Smythe and Jones movie. That's that that <laughs> deserves a cinematic. Universe. They should have had Smythe and Jones in uh, do the whole Disney thing in in Wreck It Ralph or whatever. Yeah, they yeah, they all the Disney stuff. Where where was their cameo? I do, I don't know. That that they'll be. Where's Smythe and Jones? Where's the Smythe and Jones level in Kingdom Hearts? They, they will get a sternly worded letter, I can guarantee you that. So I think in the Disney universe, Smythe and Jones are like talk show hosts, <laughs> and they like kind of just kind of know everybody. Yeah. You know, because they, they're in contact with all the characters, pretty much, and they can just kind of bring them in. Well, you uh, know, except the villains—they don't like the villains at all. Well, no one likes the villains. You know, it's it's it, it's like everyone would if they brought Whoa. if they brought the actual <laughs> well, well, no, well, it, within these universes, understand? No one if they brought the actual villains on this show, everyone would get angry at them for giving the villains platforms, and you know, they, they don't want to get canceled. <laughs> They don't. No one. No one. No one wants to be fair. D platform Disney villains, guys. All I'm saying is, no one wants to be fairy tale Bill Maher. That's all I'm. That's all I'm saying. Give Gaston a platform. (laughs) Bring him on. Yeah. yeah. Is he the king of the incels? Gaston. (laughs) No. No. Gaston is not an incel. (laughs) No college says no to Gaston. 
Okay. <laughs> How dare they not let me speak at their con? I don't know. Gaston is a big fan of wearing bright red. I'll say that. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, he uses, he uses antlers <coughs> in all of his decorating. Some people only use antlers in some of their decorating. Those people are pussies! I think you're right about this. We're on to something. Yeah. <laughs> Gaston loves the Second Amendment and his, and his truck. No one calls people cucks like Gaston. Let's talk about the Tangled one a little bit. And just about how it's infinitely better than Beauty and the Beast. I personally like the Beauty and the Beast one a little more because they play a little bit more with it. I, but that, but that's just me. Maybe I think it's just the film Tangled lends itself a bit more to the comedic sensibility of this show. Yeah, perhaps. Whereas I feel like B- Beauty and the Beast is a little bit more... It takes itself a bit more seriously where Tangled, it's like, eh, it gives you a little bit more room to play. Yeah, I mean... Bell doing like these mugging gags doesn't really work for me. <laughs> well, no, but but at the same time, I appreciate the fractured fairy tales value of of you know okay, this doesn't lend itself to being goofy. Well, we're gonna make it goofy anyway. I I, I like the audacity of that. I like that they actually did a song from Tangled in the Tangled one. I mean, I mean, they led up to be our guest like it was gonna happen, but it just doesn't. Right. Yeah, they they re- <laughs> they referenced be our guest at one point, but then they, yeah. I, I I did like the scene where the guy was like like changing hats on every line to play like three different characters at once. That was that was a tour de force right there. I mean, they're both like Ugh. solely reliant on the two actors playing Smith Smythe and Jones, and I feel like it really is kind of like a gamble of whether or not you're getting really good performers who are putting it all into it. Or ones that are kind of like, ah, it's a kid's show. Let let the kids laugh at you for a second. Who cares? Yeah, it's the it's the Jungle Cruise skipper conundrum. It, it, it it's like it's a total crapshoot, and you gotta if you get someone good, then it's a good show. But if you don't, it can really suck. And that was disgusting. I apologize for that. I think I will be the next Jones, and Jess, you can be my Smythe. I call. No, I want to play William Shatner playing the piano. <laughs> <laughs> William, yeah, there was the spot in Tangle. They p- go over to the piano, and it's William Shatner. He's just playing. Wait, what? <laughs> Wait, in the video, the there's a guy who looks looking... like William Shatner. I don't know what video recording we got, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously, they change actors all the time. So any video you see will not necessarily be indicative of the show you see live there. So I, anyway. Yes, of course. <laughs> so um, well, who'd you get playing piano? Now, I don't know if they came up with the same character name, but I believe his name was Sir Samuel of Morocco. It, it, is that the name they just give to everyone, or is yeah, that... Yeah, that's the name they, they give everybody, Okay, yeah. so, so it, it's a character who does nothing but play piano. No, the, um, my guy was uh, d- didn't look a thing like Shatner, I'll tell you that much. That's That kind of ruins a little bit of the value, yeah. I think. What are you gonna? He. I would recommend these shows he, if he you did, can get Shatner on the piano. He looked exactly like Chris Pine, obvious, uh, oddly yeah, enough. Yeah, if you can get Shatner, got to get that. He he can't he can't sing, but he can play piano. Oddly enough. Before we move on to the next one, um, let's talk about our cheese ratings for the two shows, um, Tangled and Beauty and the Beast, at the I forgot what the theater was called. I'm such a the bad Royal host. Theater at the Royal Theater. Royal Theatre. Mm-hmm. All right, Andrew, what is your cheese rating? Uh, Beauty and the Beast, I'm going to give my cheese rating is a garbage can in a red vest. That, <laughs> And then t- Tangled is a, is a garbage can in a wig. Uh, that's, that's all I've got. I didn't like either of these. I thought they were bad. I don't know. The humor is not up my alley at all. All right, uh, my cheese rating is... A mool cheese spread for both of them because they're an artificial rind and they are vegetarian, but they aren't vegan. Do I have to give a cheese rating or? Yes. You just have to make up any cheese that you relate to. If you like cheese. Your your rubric (laughs) confuses me. I I will give um, (laughs) uh, to the to the Beauty and the Beast show. I will give the the gray stuff and. Uh, look, because let let's ah. just pretend that's cheese. Why not? And to the tangled show, Why not? It's I will delicious. give try the gray stuff. I will give a slightly grayer gray stuff because it's even <laughs> less colorful. I thought you were gonna give it gold or gray stuff. The gold stuff for because of her hair. You'd think so, but no. 
Shouldn't her hair be short because her hair got yeah, cut that, off at the end of the that movie? Is, uh, that's not that's not explained, is there? It, it, is it? Um, yeah, excuse sure. me, you guys. Have they, you seen the TV show where she gets her hair back? Ugh. <laughs> that's TV. It doesn't count. Exactly. That's not canon. It is canon. I mean, Zachary Levi and Mandy Moore are back. Well, yeah, but when was the last time you saw Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. referenced in a Marvel movie? I rest my case. I'm Coulson and Captain Marvel. Let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. Why Audible? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. Um, the book we'd recommend is The Disneyland Story, The Unofficial Guide to the Evolution of Walt Disney's Dream by Sam Genoway, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese for your free audiobook. Well, thank you for letting us interrupt you. Let's get back to it. Yes, please. Mickey and the Magical Map. This this is a, del- this is a delightful clusterfuck, isn't it? <laughs> It is a uh, man. This show really goes south, guys. It really does. <laughs> it's 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 it. Let, let's talk. Uh, l- l- if I may, um, <laughs> would you like to hear some history on this one? Would love to. If you've got some, definitely. All right, I've got histories on all of these. Um, the M- Mickey and the Magical Map is performed at the Fantasyland Theater, uh, which is a large five thousand square foot outdoor amphitheater located on the exact opposite end of Fantasyland as the Royal Theater, near Mickey's Toontown and It's a Small World. It first opened in 1985 as Videopolis, which I'm not kidding was Disneyland's attempt at a nighttime dance club. This was this was the beginning of the. Yeah, this was the beginning of the Eisner era when they were really desperate to attack to attract teenagers by any means necessary. So they opened this dance club at the far end of Fantasyland with music videos playing on enormous screens all over the place. Uh, that concept was abandoned in 1989. The venue was converted into a theater space where they mostly put on shows based on Disney movies, including the Beauty and the Beast show I mentioned earlier that ran for three years, a Pocahontas show that ran for two years, and in the 2000s there was a Snow White show that ran for another two years. Then from uh, from 2006 to 2012... Uh, They stopped running shows in there altogether and turned the venue into a meet-and-greet space for the princesses, but then they opened the aforementioned Fantasy Fair in 2013, and they they turned the theater back into a theater and put Mickey and the Magical Map there, which, I'm not kidding, has been running longer than any other show that's ever been in that theater. Like, it it, it opened in 2013. Uh, As of this May, I believe, it'll be there for six years and no other show in that theater has has lasted anywhere near that long. So that's uh, that's an achievement right there, That'll I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the show that's, itself. That's the Phantom of the Opera of Disneyland. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the show itself is a combination of live actors and dancers and and screen effects. They have this giant you know screen in the back of it. Uh, in the plot of the show is that the sorcerer Yen Sid, Disney spelled backwards, from Fantasia invents this magical map with a space missing in it. And his apprentice, Mickey, tries to fill in that space with a paintbrush and accidentally gets magically transported all around the world to where choreographed musical numbers from various Disney movies are performed. And it's this bizarre blend of live actors and on-screen effects and core and and none of it fits together or makes any sense. And I kind of love it. It's there's puppets. 
There's yeah, puppets there, there are puppets. There's a there's a Sebastian puppet at one point during the under the sea sequence. Uh, the he gets transported. The the first thing is he gets transported to India, where King Louis comes out and sings "I Want to Be Like You." Then there's a weird princess medley between. <clears throat> between Pocahontas singing Just Around the River Bend, Mulan singing Reflection, and Rapunzel and Flynn again singing I See the Light. So they could afford singing Rapunzel for this show, but not for the other show. Um, and and, and also, They got both of them. And also, it's so are we led to believe that we're in Virginia, China, or Europe? What is... It, it's completely inconsistent where the hell we're even being thrown to. Uh, then they go it's under a magic map. You're in all three. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It's magic, bitch. <laughs> magic because fuck you. Uh, then I they go underwater because the King Louis we saw was much smaller than the Louis I'm used to seeing, and his <laughs> voice it was nowhere near as like Brooklyny as it was in the movie. So I I don't know what they were going for. Yeah, they 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 didn't use the original Louis Prima recording from the movie. They they clearly got Jim Cummings, uh, who voiced Louis on Tailspin, uh, to re-record the vocals uh, for that. <laughs> then they got a large uh, Sebastian puppet to. Uh, then they do an under the sea number with the large Sebastian puppet. Uh, then we get transported to Hawaii, where Stitch and a bunch of dancers sing Hawaiian roller coaster ride. And then in the big finale, they go to New Orleans, where Tiana sings Dig a Little Deeper, even though that's not her song in the movie. It's it's Mama Odie's song. But And in between the songs, Mickey tries to paint over the missing spot, and shenanigans ensue. Um, so what do we have to say about this? <laughs> what What is there to say? I mean, it's just... It's just a jukebox kind of musical where they just kind it of is, yeah. do a bunch of songs from a bunch of different shows. I mean, <laughs> but there's no connection even... to it. Like, there's nothing connecting these specific things. At least, not a thing. Kind of <laughs> in fan- phantasmic. There is a little bit of a connection, like dreams. Generally, Mickey's dream, you know. And here, it's just you know, j- is... just putting you know a GPS on random, essentially. Like, like just put just put all the locations of the world on shuffle, and there's your show. Um. Now, uh, a few things. I uh, Again, I do appreciate that they had a live trumpet player. The music is mostly... That was pre- pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, the music is mostly pre-recorded, but for I Want to Be Like You, and then again for Dig a Little Deeper, they actually bring a live trumpet player out to... To do the to do the kind of um, the equivalent of Baloo and Louie doing their scat, you know, rap battle in in the movie. Instead, it's just Louie and a trumpet player just going back and forth with it. And that, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, although it is weirdly uncomfortable because they actually do a different instrumentation to "I Want to Be Like You" to make it sound a little more authentically Indian. Which like they add a sitar or whatever, and uh, and it feels a little uncomfortable <laughs> like like uh, first of all the 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 choreographed dancers are predominantly white and 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 even the and even the ones who are not white uh, don't look particularly indian so it's so it's a little meh. And, and, although when you think about it the original movie uh, even though it took place in india it could not have had less to do with india so so it it just feels weird that they're suddenly trying to make it, it authentic. In I thought it was in, in Africa in some way. Uh, the uh, some more notes I wrote. Uh, the under the sea sequence has these horrifying giant bubbles that the dancers climb inside, and I I don't know what the deal was with that. Do you uh, do you guys have any thoughts? I'm trying to remember. Like, like this is the hardest to remember. I, I don't, All I remember was, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it, it, a bit schizophrenic. <laughs> it just goes through you so fast that that you can't really retain any of it. It's, it's just sheer randomness. It's just like it's like someone put in like Disney number one hits a CD and just put it on shuffle. And now that's what I call <laughs> Disney. Then. then, then yeah, no, that's what I call Disney, and then you put it in your car radio, and you hit shuffle, and then this is the show. Yeah. And it's tied together by, like, audio of Mickey, like, I need to find the, like, little brush and, like, get the paint cover and up. Yeah. All the monkeys oh, are coming God. out at me. <laughs> and by the way, there, there, there's one point 
where Mickey is chasing the, it goes back and forth between having actually a live guy in a Mickey suit, you know, chasing the thing on screen and, and the guy in the Mickey suit on the screen itself, like flying around trying to chase the thing. And, and instead of doing like a CGI Mickey or something, they actually filmed a guy in a Mickey suit against a green screen, and there are so many moments where the footage of him chasing this dot around is so clearly either slowed down or sped up at seemingly random intervals. Like, they didn't get the timing they quite <laughs> wanted, and they were too cheap to do reshoots. If you've done any video editing, as I obviously have, it is painfully obvious that that's what they've done, and it looks really bad. Um... The other interesting thing is Yen Sid, the sorcerer, is a giant. Mickey is the size of a regular guy, yeah. but Yen Sid projecting on the screen is this giant, you know, imposing figure. So are we to understand that this is the one Disney product where Mickey is an actual mouse? Like is <laughs> No, he's it, the same size as all the actual humans though. No, like, but uh, all the other apprentices he's the same size. Well, Occam's razor, like like is Yen Sid really a giant or is Mickey just the size of a mouse in this case? So he, is this like a Willard situation where Yen Sid is this demented lunatic who just keeps rodents around and talks to them and he he thinks he's a wizard and oh this map will teleport you to wherever you want. Isn't that nice, Mickey? Mickey, why don't you talk to me, Mickey? What are you doing? And and you know, He's he's just on the sidewalk. Mickey talking spills to these. paint all over it. Oh yeah, the mouse I spills spill, paint all over his all over I his map. Spill, You're I not ready to be a real apprentice yet. Apprentice. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> or the other option was, um, the other option is he's just a general snow hologram. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah you go be. behind the curtain and and there's just a guy <laughs> with an even smaller mouse, wizard, and that's. So that's why that... he looks like a cheap CGI. So Mickey, <laughs> so is Mickey the Kylo Ren in this case? Is he like, let go of the past, destroy it if you have to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, they should have. Where's the Disney live musical paint show? I mean, the Star <laughs> Wars one. Kylo spilled paint all over. They have a Jedi training academy show where. But it's not a musical, so we're not discussing it for this show. I'm sure the Disney parks are full of Star Wars right now, right? Oh, absolutely. I, I haven't been there in a while, but I can only imagine. Jam-packed. And, and it's going to be even more this summer when Galaxy's Edge opens. Ooh, boy. Um, but but uh, my favorite part is at the end when the whole show, when all of Mickey and the Magical Map just kind of galaxy brains itself when Yen Sid uh, imparts the moral of the of the what passes for a story, I guess, in this thing. And he says the whole point is that the map is incomplete. The map is supposed to be incomplete. The map will never be complete as long as there is imagination left in the world, which is a reference to Walt Disney's philosophy on Disneyland itself. He often said exactly that Disneyland will never be com will never be finished as long as there's imagination left in the world, meaning this place will always have new things added and old things subtracted from it for as long as it exists, which is a nice reference for the park fans. The problem is it casts the entire show we just saw in a whole new light because it implies the map was not a map of the world, but a map of the park. So, and even that doesn't scan. Well, I mean, scan, that makes sense. <laughs> but it doesn't even scan because the Little Mermaid ride is in DCA and there's no land in either park to represent China. And we go to Adventureland twice in the show between the jungle scene and the Hawaii scene. And neither one has the ride IP. It's not Jungle Cruise and the Tiki Room. It's Jungle Book and Lilo and Stitch. And Tomorrowland is completely unrepresented. And representing Frontierland with Pocahontas is a huge stretch. So it, it, it just opens a whole other can of worms. It's it's But, you know, the answer, as always, is it's just a random ass theme park show. So who cares? <laughs> imagination. Yeah, and they and they sing another song about imagination. They 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 sing. <laughs> it's it's the favorite word of that park. Even though these shows have so little imagination attached to them, they just keep. Can we they, just it, get the imagination song back, please? If we just if we just Disney? say 
Well, it's still in Florida. It's still in Florida, but attached to a horrible ride now. But that's a whole other story. It's like if we keep pounding get, get the, the real word, one. if we keep pounding the word imagination into it, we'll th- then then kids will be tricked into thinking they've seen something imaginative. I guess that's uh, what are you gonna do? Ugh. But in the end, the moral still was: let the past die, kill it if you have to. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> So I guess uh-huh. this really was the last well, Jedi. I... <laughs> yeah, and uh, the but, last apprentice. <laughs> you know, if, if only the last Jedi haters would direct their ire at Mickey and the Magical Map instead of at the last Jedi, then then what a wonderful world it yeah. would Mickey be. Mickey and the Magical we Map guys, was the hashtag working title take of the Force down Awakens. The magic map. <laughs> uh, take down the Magic Map. Get get on Twitter. We're going. Sign my petition to remake the magic map. Love the scene where Admiral Akbar says, it's a map. <laughs> well, on that note, you guys want to talk about Frozen? Let's we talk gotta about cheese Frozen. Ratings, sir. Oh, cheese ratings, of course. Oh, a cheese rating. <laughs> what cheese rating do you give a fucking map? Oh, my goodness. Well, it's a magic map. I don't map. fucking. I mean, Mickey's a mouse, so he likes cheese, right? Yeah. <laughs> does Mickey like cheese? What type of cheese does Mickey eat? Has he ever eaten cheese? I know in House of Mouse, occasionally he would make they would make a plot point of Mickey trying to eat cheese, but otherwise, it very rarely comes up. Surprisingly, I, this is a I'm gonna give it a cheesecake. I don't know why I'm I'm out of ideas, but it's a cheesecake because it is it is layered uh, with different <laughs> Disney properties. All right, how about you, Tony? You got one off the top of your head. Uh, I give it a moldy, filthy, hair-colored piece of cheese that the homeless Yen Sid is feeding to his beloved pet rodents, who are his only friends in the world. That's a good type of cheese. I- I'd have some of that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't. But... Uh, I'd pick brie because no one fucking likes brie. Frozen, yes, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, frozen. Now, Frozen Live at the Hyperion, specifically, uh, this is located at Disney California Adventure, which is the sister park to Disneyland, located right across from Disneyland Park uh, in its former parking lot. Uh, The Hyperion Theater is an enormous theater located in the Hollywoodland section of that park. Uh, The selling point of the Hyperion is that it's not just where you see another generic off-the-shelf diversion at a theme park. This is Disney's attempt to build a legitimate Broadway-caliber theater, spelled with an R-E at the end, uh, that where you can see a Broadway caliber theatrical experience that's free with the price of admission. That is the selling point. Uh, the the Hyperion was an they open. They tried. Yeah, yeah. They they de- and the uh, if if I may go into history again, uh, the Hyperion was an opening day attraction that opened with the park in two thousand one. Uh, at that time, it was showing a Disney musical review show called Steps in Time. That only lasted there for a few months. It was replaced by something called The Power of Blast in November of 01. That lasted almost a year before being replaced by Aladdin, a musical spectacular, which ran in the park for 15 years. So that's really the phantom of this uh, of this park is oh. Aladdin. Yeah, Aladdin, a musical Freaking- spectacular. Which, by the way, predated the actual Broadway version of Aladdin that eventually opened. Uh, and Al- they even got Alan Menken to write a whole new song. Spe- uh, uh, a whole new song. Well, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but Alan Menken wrote... Got him! Yep, a whole. A, a, I see what I did there. I don't know about you, but <laughs> Alan Menken uh, wrote a new song specifically for that production, just for the park, uh, called "To Be Free," which Jasmine sings at one point, and it slows the entire musical to a grinding halt, and it's not very good. But anyway, uh, at one point in 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 Aladdin's uh, long running uh, time at the Hyperion. At one point, Disney announced that it would be replaced by Toy Story the Musical, which had been running on the Disney Cruise Line for a while, but after a lot of fan outcry, those plans were canceled, and Aladdin uh, lasted several more years until finally 2016, when Aladdin was out and Frozen was in. Uh, Now, from a technical standpoint, from a technical standpoint... This Frozen show 
absolutely succeeds at being Broadway caliber, as far as I'm concerned. It, it, it goes way beyond typical theme park show fare. The set pieces are amazing. The choreography is impeccable. The actors, for the most part, are really good and really good singers. Like, like at least when I saw it on Monday, uh, the woman who played Elsa uh, was every bit as good a singer as the wickedly talented Adele Dazeem, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they have these huge IMAX screens with these beautiful swooping shots of Arendelle. They have this enormous icy looking staircase that spins around on stage in the Let It Go sequence. They built a huge replica of the ice chandelier from the movie, which descends from the ceiling during Let It Go. Uh, there's a great quick change effect where they shut out the lights for like half a second and Elsa pulls on a tab that turns her outfit into the iconic ice dress in like, in like, like that, like in a second. Uh, there's a great projection effect where Anna is turned into an ice sculpture at the end. It's genuinely impressive. Uh, it's it's an incredible spectacle on a technical level. They clearly spent an insane amount of money on it, and it's all up there on the stage. But on a creative level, it's just the movie. Like that's all they did. They just took the movie and they and they and they cut a few scenes from it and they put it on stage and that's it. It's just another Disney movie show where you don't unless you're like just a huge Frozen fan, story-wise there's really no reason for you to see it unless you just want to see this movie translated to the stage with as much money behind it as possible. And in that case, you know, there is a Broadway version of Frozen now, so but I guess this is for if you can't afford that. So let me say some words about the Broadway version of Frozen, though. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and how this compares. Um, the Broadway version of Frozen is an inferior product to this, in my opinion, believe it or not. Um, See, I've never actually I've never seen the Broadway version of Frozen, nor have I heard the cast album, actually. But the thing that causes an issue with the Broadway version of Frozen is it does so many storytelling loop de loops to try to make Let It Go the ending of Act One. So it elongates oh, okay. everything in the first act till it's just this slog of an hour and ten minutes just so that they can ah. end Act 1 with Let It Go. Then Act 2 is just like racing Gotta through the rest of it. Gotta have that crowd pleaser ending. It, yeah, and it's effective. Like I not I actually think this is a little bit more effective because of the stage um, staircase and all that. And the quick time like change in the Broadway show, she has like her costume on strings and someone just yanks it off her and she's there. There's no darkness, but it looks goofy. So I almost prefer it going dark <laughs> and it goes by quicker and I'm altogether more pleased as opposed to the Broadway show where I just feel exhausted. Um, if I'm going to see just the movie frozen on stage, I'm going to pick this one. <laughs> yeah. Let it go. <laughs> Let It Go is an act one break in cinematic terms. In, 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 as far as a three-act structure that movies have, Let It Go is the great act one closer for, for the movie. Yeah, as far as it being the halfway point or, or in Broadway terms, like because act one is usually considerably longer than act two in a Broadway show. So yeah, that, that would be a horrible place for it. <laughs> um, and that's why the show doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, the show in uh, at DCA works pretty well as far as, um, I, like I said, the biggest problem with it is that it's just not very creative as its own thing. It's 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 basically just the movie, and and what little they do change is mostly in service of playing to the cheap seats, which is weird because all the sh all the seats are equally free with admission. So. <laughs> But um, like, for example, there's there's a scene they add to the DCA version where the castle staff get some wacky slapstick in in the middle of the for the first time in forever sequence, which didn't quite work for me. I, I mean, I guess it's fun to watch, but it's like there's there's really no other reason for it to be there other than to give people something dynamic to watch during for the first time in forever. Uh, they completely you got a bunch of little kids in the seats. That, sorry, go on. You you have a bunch of little kids in the seats. You you got to please them and keep them quiet. You know. <laughs> and all you it's want not, is air conditioning. So you, you, you just want to sit and be cool for a few minutes. Be cool. Ha, ah, frozen. <laughs> it's the thing. Um Go um they uh they cut the ice monster completely. So now instead of 
Elsa summoning the big ice monster to chase off Anna and 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 Kristoff. Uh, she just shuts them out, and there's this big door that shows up. And they cut the scene where Hans and his guards uh, capture Elsa. Now it's like th- th- you you see Elsa kick Anna and Kristoff out. And then later on, uh, Hans just tells Anna, we've got Elsa imprisoned in the dungeon, and you don't see how she gets there. But but I guess if you've seen the movie, which we all have, you see it that way. Um, they use these uh, Julie Taymor Lion King puppets for Sven and Olaf, where you can see there's an actor there, but you don't really care because it's a really good puppet that draws your attention. And I especially really like the way the Sven puppet worked, which was basically the actor's front legs are Sven's front legs, or, or the, the actor's legs are Sven's front legs. Uh, Sven's hind legs are pulled by little strings, and then the actor's head pokes out of Olaf, uh, uh, of Sven's back, so it looks like Sven just has a disembodied head on his back at all times, which is very, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's very intimidating. <laughs> It was I must kind say. of weird. I wouldn't fuck with a reindeer. <laughs> it's weird to look at. I wouldn't fuck with a reindeer who had a disembodied head on his back. I'll, that's all I'm going to say. Um, now, the one weird thing they did add to the to the to the DCA show was at the very end when the whole cast d- ends with a reprise of of all songs, "Love Is an Open Door," which has now been recontextualized as a- Anna and Elsa's sisterly love for each other is the real open door that has opened the doors to the kingdom. And the weirdest touch they added to it was that their dead parents show up again presumably as ghosts, but they're in the theater's opera boxes, like Statler and Waldorf, <laughs> just just showing I up. I thought to... I imagined that. No, that, that, <laughs> that was that's real? there. That, that, actually... that, that is in the show. They, uh, in the, the, the dead parents show up in the opera boxes to, like, look down like spirits and, and take a little credit, I guess, for fucking up their kids, because it was their idea to keep Elsa locked away. It's like, how dare you soak up some of the credit? You Fuck you. Well, I mean, it was also those little magic rock things idea to right, fuck right. everybody up too. So, yeah, it's can like... I can I also chime in that in the Broadway show they do a very similar thing where they instead of using love as an open door, they do a reprise of Let It Go, except instead of oh, Let the Storm man. Rage On, they use Let the Sun Shine On. Oh come on, that is that's weak. stupid. Now, let it go is not That's a, really weak. Let it glow. Let it glow. Let it go is not an act. Is not a show closer. It's it's specifically for Elsa's moment of of stepping in. Oh, oh that's stupid. But it's it's the it's, big everyone hit. likes the song. It has to be the whole yeah, show. It's the big hit single. It's got to do the thing. Yeah, whatever. How many times do you think they're gonna sing it in the sequel? It, I don't know. It might not be in the sequel. The, uh, you know, the uh, I don't know when you're going to release this, but um, uh, the day we're recording it, they just released the first teaser trailer for Frozen 2, and it looks amazing. I mean, it's a it's a great teaser trailer, if nothing else. It, 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 w- one thing I love about it is it looks so unlike the first movie. Like, like it's sort of this fa- this Lord of the Rings fantasy epic quest to go somewhere and do something, presumably. But it's all moody, and there's no dialogue whatsoever in the teaser, which I really like. And uh, and yeah, it just it just looks it just looks awesome, and I and and I hope it's good. Frozen two, we're X Men now. I hope it's good as well. Yeah, <laughs> I just I want to see uh, I want to see Elsa and Frozone team up is what I want. There there you go. That's like a, in a, in a buddy cop movie, that'd be amazing. <sighs> Yeah, Just, we'll, we'll have Frozone, Frozone, and Elsa. Have Frozone show up in the post credits tag to think you think you're the only Ice Queen out there. There's a whole other universe, <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a tiara on. Frozone's an Ice yeah. Queen. <laughs> he's got the. <laughs> <laughs> I'd I'd like to I'd like to tell you about the Avenge Ice Initiative. But but getting back to the to the theme park show, uh, one of the biggest problems with it is how time-consuming it is. You have to get in line for it at least, and I mean at least half an hour before showtime. Longer is recommended if you want a decent seat, like 45 minutes to an hour beforehand. And then the show itself is like an hour long. So all told, it's at least a two-hour commitment, or at least a 90-minute commitment, more likely like a two-hour commitment, which is a big chunk of a day at the parks, especially if Mm -hmm. you're coming in from out of town and you only have... 
uh, a limited amount of time to spend there. So I only recommend it if you're a huge Frozen fan and you have multiple days to spend there. And, um, and when you think about it, like the Frozen show and the Royal Theater shows are kind of the polar, uh, they're the polar inverses of each other because the Frozen show is this lavish budget, but no creativity. And the Royal Theater shows have practically no budget and a lot of creativity, at least by theme park show standards. So make of that what you will. I'm willing to agree with you on that, um, but if you're going to just watch it on YouTube, um, sure, it would kill an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you got an hour to kill, watch it on YouTube. But isn't it so much better to pay all this money and actually go go see the show in person? <laughs> it's like, I. No, I. I it's like you'd think with all of these theme park shows on uh, with with all these theme park attractions, like every ride is on YouTube now. You'd think that would thin the crowds out a little at these parks, but no. If if anything, the crowds have only gotten it's free worse, advertising. And I, I if 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 anything, the crowds have only gotten worse, and I don't understand why. So. <sighs> Let the crowds rage on. What's frozen? <laughs> The crowd's Watch Frozen always on, uh, on YouTube. Me every day. And... <laughs> do we give a cheese? Do we give a cheese rating on this one? Sure. Um, I'll go with mine first. Um, mine is a microwavable mozzarella cheese stick that's in the freezer, so it's frozen stick. That's what cheese. I was gonna do. <laughs> that's why I did mine first. <laughs> oh fuck! Fuck you. Yeah, I'm doing frozen cheese as well. I will step outside the box and give it a Norwegian Jarlsberg, which is one of my favorite kinds of cheese anyway, and it's Norwegian, and uh, and Frozen is Scandinavian, if nothing else, and the Frozen ride at Epcot is in the Norway Pavilion, so Norwegian Jarlsberg it is. Rest in peace, that little boat ride. <laughs> Maelstrom. Yeah, I'm gonna... I'm yeah. just the Maelstrom. It's... Hey, what are you going to do? Hey, maybe we can still get cheese there. Maybe. Just to wrap this up and remind you guys, today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a free title and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audible.com, oh, sorry, audibletrial.com slash musicalswithcheese. All right, so, Tony, I know you've got a lot of stuff you want to promote. Promote it out for there for the world. Uh, you can find all my YouTube video content at youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark. Uh, you can find, and, and since you mentioned my uh, comedy music um, quote-unquote career a while back, uh, you can still purchase my 2014 album, Goldmark After Dark, at tony-goldmark.bandcamp.com. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, at Tony Goldmark. So check all that stuff out. And and may I just say one more thing about Frozen that I forgot to say earlier? Um, theme park. I know it's not the show's fault. Theme park audiences don't know how to applaud. Like they don't know how to be appreciative audiences because they're just been shuffled into this thing. And literally, like until the "Let It Go" sequence in the Frozen show, every song and these performers are singing their hearts out on stage. Every song gets a light smattering of applause. It, it's like no, nothing more. It wasn't. An, it only at "Let It Go" and the finale did the audience really go nuts for it. And uh, but yeah, theme park audiences, y'all need to learn how to applaud because these actors. That's why they do it, you know? This anyway. PSA is brought to you by Tony Goldmark. Oh, yes. Applaud for your performers, audiences. Be, be, don't be Applaud a Applaud for these Disney World people. Yes. Applaud mm. on Jungle Cruise. They are not well paid. <laughs> they need your applause. Applaud on Haunted Mansion. <laughs> Madame Leota doesn't do this for her health. <laughs> <laughs> you think the pirates animatronics can't hear you? They hear everything. Applaud every time you see them. Applaud! Remind them that you're watching. <laughs> I just want to hear constant clapping. You walk in the park, you start clapping. Yes! <laughs> if you're on I the Incredible Coaster, you gotta applaud. 
And if I'm going to give a personal recommendation for Tony Goldmark's videos, um, he very much does a good job at keeping them consistent. You could start at the beginning, but if you don't want to do that and you want to start like in the middle, I really, really like his Escape to Tomorrow three-part series. That's like a Escape really, really well-made, um, wonderful, like three-part segment. Well, thank you very much. Um, and if you're listening to his music, Goldmark After Dark, I bought it with my own money, and I must oh. say that Officer Down is something that I have a joy <laughs> every time it comes up on my shuffle. Ah, the most problematic song I've ever recorded. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm, that's the one I'm choosing to endorse. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I was young. I didn't know what I was thinking. I wash my hands. Of, I wouldn't do it now, but if you like it, I got it. Uh, Me and Jess will cover fair. it for you. Okay. You, you, you do that. You do that. That would be a really hard cover to do. Um, like, it's very specifically all because of the voice. Yeah. <laughs> which I will, a voice which I will not replicate on this podcast. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Um, please leave us reviews on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all at Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals. Our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is Musical Theater Lives. Get a, shoot us an email at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our title card is created by Jolene Casco. Her Instagram is at Jolene Casco. Um, thank you guys for listening. Um, anyone else have any th- final statements to say before we wrap this on up? The cheese never bothered me no. anyway. All right. That's, That's a good quote. I'm Jess. My statement. <laughs> and I'm Andrew. And this was Musicals with Cheese. Uh.